The Polestar 4 is an SUV coupe. From the exterior, it has got that coupe style, and from the interior, it's got that SUV spaciousness, at least according to the manufacturer. Now, at the time of filming and in UK, you have got two models. You've got the long range single motor, which starts from £60,000, and then you've got the long range dual motor, which is on review, for which costs roughly £70,000. Now, in this video, we're actually been comparing it to some of its competitors and also seeing how it actually performs across the board. So to kick things off, let's talk about its electric range. And here you have got a whopping 100 kilowatt hour battery pack or 94 kilowatt hour, which is usable and a heat pump that comes included as standard on both the single motor and the dual motor variants. Now, the single motor has got a WLTP claim of 385 miles, while the dual motor model, which is on review, has got 367 miles. Well, what I can say is from my own mixed driving test and using the dynamic preset via the infotainment system, I noticed a range of 270 to 290 miles, which is a little bit off the manufacturer's claim, but nonetheless is still a very impressive figure. If you do look at some of its competitors, you will be able to see over here that it does actually fare very well, and therefore its overall range is actually very impressive. That large battery pack really does come in clutch. Now, when it comes to recouping energy while on the move, you have got the ability of enabling or disabling one pedal drive. And this gives you the ability of lifting off the accelerator pedal and harvesting energy back into the battery pack via regenerative braking. Now, you can do this via the infotainment system at any given point, or you can even access one of the shortcuts via the steering wheel, which is good thinking via the manufacturer. Now here I'm in one pedal drive, I'm driving at 30 miles an hour, and if I were to lift off the accelerator pedal, the vehicle will decelerate pretty harshly and come to a complete standstill. Now, of course, if I don't want that behavior, I can disable it altogether. And yet again, I'm just gonna go up to 30 miles an hour and lift off, and here I just keep on coasting at roughly 30 miles an hour. In fact, I'm gaining a little bit of speed because I'm going a little bit downhill. Now it's good to see that the manufacturer has provided you the ability to enable and disable one pedal drive. And also you've got the option of going for a lower preset, which doesn't give you the full one pedal driving experience, but rather still decelerates when you lift off the accelerator pedal. Some of the other manufacturers out there, namely, for example, the likes of Tesla, don't give you the option anymore. So it's good to see that Polestar has still thought about that for their customer base. Now, of course, you do also have the ability of plugging it in and via its CCS port, it'll take up to 200 kilowatts of input. Therefore, if you do find an appropriate high speed charger, you can go from 10 to 80 percent in just half an hour. Now, you have also got an 11 kilowatt onboard charger that comes fitted as standard. However, at the time of filming and in the UK, you've also got the plus pack, which comes included as free and therefore means you've got a 22 kilowatt onboard charger. This means via the 22 kilowatt input, you can go from zero to 100% in just five and a half hours. And for an 11 kilowatt wall box, it will take you 11 hours. Of course, this time extends up if you were to connect up to a regular single face seven kilowatt wall box, or of course, a regular three pin input. So moving on, we get onto performance. And here in the long range single motor, you have got a rear wheel drive configuration, which outputs 200 kilowatts of power or 272 horsepower. You've also got 343 Newton meters of torque. It's claimed to go from zero to 60 miles an hour in 6.9 seconds and has a top speed of 124 miles an hour. Now in the tested long range dual motor, you have got an all wheel drive configuration, which outputs 400 kilowatts of power or 544 horsepower and 686 Newton meters of torque. It has a claimed zero to 60 mile an hour time of 3.7 seconds and the same top speed of 124 miles an hour. Now, intriguingly, the all wheel drive model disengages the front motor when you're driving on the motorway. This is to increase your overall efficiency and therefore operates as effectively a rear wheel drive vehicle only. Now, this is actually quite different from the Polestar 3, which does the exact opposite. Now, in terms of my own tested figures using RaceLogic's performance box touch, the long range dual motor clocked in from zero to 20 miles an hour in 1.18 seconds, zero to 30 miles an hour in 1.75 seconds, zero to 60 miles an hour in 3.8 seconds, so very much close to the manufacturer's claim, and from 50 to 70 miles an hour in 1.79 seconds. I also clocked in a peak acceleration of 0.8 Gs. 
Aside from its seriously impressive straight line speed, what really stands out to me is its overall handling characteristics. See here, unlike a lot of its rivals, you've got a good sense of connection with the front axle. And this means that when you're going around winding country routes at speed, you can really put your foot down and enjoy the drive. Furthermore, you've got a 50-50% weight distribution on the dual motor model, and this moves over to a 48-52% split in the single motor model. Thanks to the fact of the battery packs being low down, you've also got a low center of gravity as well. Now, better still, the overall suspension system is a work of art, at least in my opinion. Indeed, over here, if you're going around winding country routes, you'll have minimal body roll. While if you're going to be pottering around town and just going to be doing, for example, the school run, the vehicle suspension system will soak up a lot of those anomalies, speed bumps and potholes, therefore making it very pleasurable. Given the fact that you can also adjust this on the fly via the infotainment system, it gives you a good degree of control as well. Now this is due to the fact that the manufacturer has given you a semi-active damper system and coil spring setup in the dual motor model, while this moves over to a high capacity passive damper system with coil springs in the single motor model. You've also got a four link setup at the front and a integral link at the back. As for its braking performance, as standard, you have got 364 millimeter disc brakes at the front and 350 millimeter disc brakes at the rear. If you were to go for the performance back, which will set you back an additional £4,000, you will have Brembo brakes with four piston setup and 392mm ventilated disc brakes at the front, while at the rear you'll have 364mm disc brakes instead. Moving swiftly on, we get onto its interior design, and here I've got no real complaints whatsoever. The overall look and feel is very much premium be it in terms of the materials that have been chosen towards the dashboard or even the trim when it comes to the upholstery. Better still, it's got that practical feel as well. And sure enough, you haven't got physical buttons and dials, but instead you have got an infotainment system with a small little bar that's found at the bottom, for example, for your climate controls. And then you have got buttons or capacitive buttons, should I say, with a haptic feel towards the steering wheel. And normally I'm not really fond of them, but the way that Polestar have actually integrated them and also gives you that somewhat degree of customization is very much appreciated. Now as for the center weighted display itself, it's a 15.4 inch landscape format and the display itself is actually very responsive. You've got all the settings that you will require and the actual intuitive feel of it that's been done by Polestar is very much appreciated. It's not gonna take anyone by surprise. Furthermore, it's running the Android Automotive OS, which therefore means that it integrates with Google Maps and gives you a good sort of degree of knowledge of how far you will be able to get on a singular charge. And it is very much similar to what you'd find on some other systems, for example, the ones that are found on Tesla. But here, it is also good to see that you have got wireless Apple CarPlay support as well, which wasn't the same thing that I could have said when I originally reviewed the Polestar 2. So it's good that you've now got Apple CarPlay for those people who are running an iOS device. Now, in terms of the driver's display, you've got a 10.2 inch landscape format it's small elongated but also customizable and you can also see google maps directly via this display which is very much appreciated furthermore in the plus pack you've also got a 14.7 inch head-up display which gives you certain indication of for example your traversing speed or the safety systems that are in operation elsewhere you have got a rear display which gives you climate controls for those who are sat at the back it is also nice to see that you have got a really punchy 12 speaker 1320 watt Harman Kardon audio system which is up from the standard 8 speaker configuration. I can safely say that the Harman Kardon audio system does actually perform well across the board and will leave a lot of people excited. Sure enough it's not going to compete with some more premium audio systems out there in the market for example the Bowers and Wilkin system that's found in the Polestar 3 or of course others but in the grander scheme of things and given the fact that it is actually included within the plus pack well it's something that you might want to consider at least if you're serious about your audio. Moving on, we get on to storage. And first off, you have got the glove box, which is electronically released via the infotainment system. It's also plenty large. Then towards the center console, at the top of it, you have got a angled wireless charger with a non-slip material, therefore making it actually pretty handy. Further down, you've got two cup holders, and then you've also got a small little storage compartment found underneath the center armrest. Here you also find two USB Type-C ports. There are also two further Type-C ports at the rear of the cabin, and intriguingly, one of them is rated up to 60 watts, which is actually really stupendously high in order for providing a fast charge. 
the ones which are found within the center armrest compartment go between 15 to 18 watts of power. Now, when it comes to the door bins, the front two are very large and will accommodate a 500 milliliter bottle alongside some small to medium sized valuables. And the rear two are unsurprisingly a little bit more limited. It's good to see that all the door bins are lined in a non-slip material as well, which means that your loose change or keys won't be heard rattling about when you're traversing uneven terrain. Now, at the back of the cabin, you have got a pull down armrest compartment, which itself has a small little non-slip area as well. Here you'll also find the buttons to recline the seats, which I'll be touching upon very shortly. Now, when it comes to the overall storage capacity, we have to, of course, talk about its boots. And here you have got 526 litres to play around with, or 1,536 litres if you drop down the seats. Here you have got a 60-40 rear split folding design with a flat floor and a hatchback design. You've also got an electric tailgate, which is included in the plus pack. Now the hatchback design makes it very practical and the same could be said about its flat floor. You've also got a small little underfloor compartment as well, which will suffice for your charging cables. On that note, you have also got a 15 litre front capacity, in other words, a storage area at the front of the vehicle, which can also be useful for taking your charging cables. Although it's worth noting over here that it's only electronically released and then manually closed. So what about when it comes to seats and comfort? Well, at the front, you've got eight way electronic controls and heated functionalities that come fit at that standard. You can go for 12 way electronic controls in the plus pack or indeed go for a massage or ventilated features as well. Now the seats themselves are very accommodating and soft and had no issues whatsoever. And the same could be said at the rear where headroom and legroom have been optimized. And therefore as someone who's just under six foot, I had no issues whatsoever. It's also good to see that Polestar has looked into providing you a near flat footwell design, meaning that the rear middle occupant won't be left uncomfortable. Now it's worth noting over here that if you do want that rear 5.7 inch display, rear heated seats, and that electronic reclining feature for the rear seats with a heated steering wheel, you'll want to go for the plus pack. Indeed, the tested vehicle did have the plus pack fitted and therefore the reclining seats were a nice touch. It therefore makes it a little bit more comfortable for those who are sat at the back on those longer journeys. Speaking about your options, if you do want a panoramic roof with liquid crystals, in other words, electrochromatic glass roof, which will effectively go from transparent to opaque within a matter of seconds, you'll have to splash out an additional 1,700 pounds. And that is not including the sunshade, which is an additional accessory, which will cost you an additional 150 pounds on top. This brings me on to its exterior design, and I'd be curious to know what you make of it down in the comment section below. Subjectively, I really do love the look of the Polestar 4. At the front, it looks pretty snazzy, thanks to the fact that you have got the headlight and side light design, which feeds into the front bumper and also the bonnet, which is a little bit flared. Towards the side, you've got a pretty sporty look, and that's namely due to the fact that you've got 20 inch alloys that come fitted as standard, or 21 inch alloys, which are available for a 1,600 pound option, or there's 21 inch alloys within the Pro Pack, which will set you back 1,800 pounds. There is also 22 inch alloys in the Performance Pack as well. It is a shame, however, that if you want body colored lower claddings, you'll have to spend an additional 900 pounds, but it's nice to see that you have got body colored wheel arches. As for the rear, you have got that nice sloped design with that elongated tail light, which goes from one end to the other. And you've also got a really nice sort of flare towards the side. Personally, I really do love what the manufacturer has achieved with the Polestar 4. Now in terms of the colors, magnesium comes as standard. However, any of the other colors will set you back between 1,000 to 1,400 pounds. Now, as for its towing capacity, the long range single motor goes up to 1,500 kilograms, while the dual motor model goes up to 2,200 kilograms. As for its roof load capacity, it's rated at 75 kilograms, and you'll have to go for a load carrier, which will cost you an additional 280 pounds. Now, while that's all very well and good, what about when it comes to safety? Well, unfortunately, at the time of filming, it's not being tested by you or NCAP, so I can't give you any sort of crash analysis. But if the Polestar 2 is anything to go by, one can only expect that the Polestar 4 will do a similarly impressive job. Now, what I can talk about are the driver assistance systems, and here you've got a plethora of them that come fitted as standard. 
Here you have got driver monitoring system, a blind spot monitoring system, exit assist, front and rear collision avoidance, lane keeping aid, oncoming lane mitigation, intelligent speed assist, and also adaptive cruise control, all of which actually do work a treat. I particularly like the adaptive cruise control with the lane keeping assist because it actually did a phenomenal job on the motorway. Now, if you do want to go for the pilot pack, which adds pilot assist and lane change assist, it'll set you back an additional £1,300. This will effectively give you steering assistance when you're on the motorway and therefore takes away the stress on those more mundane motorway drives. On the subject of safety, this brings me on to one of the biggest features of the Polestar 4, and that is the omission of a rear view window. Now, this might be controversial to certain individuals, but as soon as you're sat within the Polestar 4, you'll quickly forget about it, specifically because of how well the automaker has integrated its camera-based system. Now, yes, indeed, there's a cameras that are set at the top towards the roof of the vehicle, and due to their positioning, it means they're not going to be affected by rain. Although it's a shame that there is no sort of washer jet, which would have given you a little bit of extra peace of mind, for example, if you're traversing muddier terrain. Nonetheless, the camera-based system itself is of high resolution and gives you an even better indication of your surroundings, especially if you're going to be indicating because it really opens up the field of view, making it even better to see what's on your left or right side. Handy, for example, when you're on the motorway. Now, within the cabin, you can quickly adjust the settings of the camera and you can also flick between a regular rear view mirror. This allows you to, for example, see if you have got children that are sat at the back and you can quickly check up on them. And then by a flick of a switch, you can then see your surroundings at the exterior of the vehicle. So yes, indeed, the implementation by Polestar has been done very well and has been really thought out, at least in my opinion. Now, furthermore, you have got sensors that are positioned around the vehicle and a 360 degree camera based system as well, which gives you even better peace of mind when it comes to parking the vehicle. And this is quite handy because the vehicle itself is a little bit chunky, but thanks to an 11.6 meter turning circle, it actually makes it a breeze to maneuver in a tight parking space. Better still, you've also got rear cross traffic alert with active braking and therefore means that if you've not seen any sort of oncoming traffic and you're reversing, it will automatically brake for you. So with all that in mind, it brings us on to a verdict on the Polestar 4. And truthfully over here, you've got a really nice stylish exterior design and a spacious interior, both at the front and rear of the cabin. You've got plenty of technology and also driver assistance systems that come featured as standard. Better still, the overall driving dynamics are there and you've got a good sort of electric range. The biggest question over here is his overall asking price. The starting point of £60,000, at least in the UK at the time of filming, is quite steep, while £70,000 gives you the dual motor model. That is with us, of course, the performance pack. Now, you might want to look at some of the alternatives and some of which we reviewed will be down in the description below. Now, I'd be curious to know if you would pick the Polestar 4 over some of its competitors. And of course, if you've enjoyed this detailed independent review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been Chris from Totally EV and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.